Now, Buddhologists, we head to the final development of Buddhism in Asia, uh, the origins of the Vajrayana, or diamond vehicle, uh, that we find dominant in Central Asia. You can see on our map here, uh, this area comprises Nepal, Tibet, Mongolia, and historically Manchuria. And it considers itself the perfection of Buddhist traditions. My advisor Geshe Lundup Sopa uh, of the Galupa Tibetan tradition said that Theravada is kind of like a propeller plane. It will take you to the far shore of Nirvana. And he said Mahayana is like a jet plane. But Tantric Buddhism, also known as Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle, is like a rocket. So that is their boast, not to being the oldest or unchanged Buddhist tradition on the planet, uh, but in their version, new and improved. In this very busy image, in Unit 1 of this series, we saw the historical Buddha launches what will become uh, a transformative movement in Asia as this psychological tradition traverses the continent. We saw in Unit 2, early Indian Buddhism uh, reveals a plethora of Buddhist traditions evolving new view and contrasting with each other over uh, issues concerning nirvana, the self, uh, and practice, as well as rituals and the rules for monks. In this image, under exoteric schools, uh, we see reference to the Mahayana traditions uh, that we looked at in our, the fifth of our series, and also those traditions emerging uh, from our third unit on Mahayana Buddhism in Central Asia. Our fifth unit then uh, shows us the development of Mahayana Buddhism in China, principally, uh, and Japan, Korea, and North Vietnam. But what we see in this map are the esoteric schools. So, if you will, they are secretive compared to the exoteric schools and Theravada. Primarily at the bottom, we see these uh, four major Tibetan sects as representatives of these esoteric schools. And if we draw the line up to the top, we'll see uh, that, wow, there is a link to Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha. The lines all end up in a new concept called Buddha Vajradhara, or the diamond wielder said to be the ultimate reality in our universe and beyond even the five meditative Buddhas of Mahayana and whom we'll discuss just shortly. And the five cosmic Buddhas of Mahayana will play a big role in the Vajrayana or Tantric school. We may remember Amitabha becomes quite popular among Chinese peasants in the so-called Pure Land or Happiness Buddhism, the easy or simple way. But then the four other Buddhas represent different qualities and colors even. So then these are the three yanas or vehicles. Theravada, uh, which we saw uh, in Unit 4, spreads to South and Southeast Asia. The classic unchanging Buddhism is their claim, uh, going back to the Buddha himself. Sutrayana points to those East Asian schools uh, that emphasize the made-up sutras that evolve in Central Asia and then become enormously influential in China and the like, such as the Lotus Sutra, among so many others. Then the Vajrayana sees itself also as the, the pure perception, the final essence of Buddha's awakening that any one of us can attain, not just a Buddha, and not just a cosmic Buddha like Mahayana will teach us. Uh, Amitabha once was a human, 
In fact, you or I, well, if we practice for many lifetimes, uh, can attain the same state as the Buddha himself. This leads to the great perfection or Dzogchen in Tibetan, uh, the final stop on the Buddhist train, if you will, in terms of its evolution in Asia. So we may be confused, what is Tantra? Well, the scholarly consensus is that Tantra emerges among the Hindu traditions. Uh, it's been called the pollution of Buddhism by Hinduism. Uh, that as Buddhism evolves through centuries in India, it eventually picks up a number of Hindu features that might have the Buddha uh, a bit annoyed. And in fact, as one Theravada guest lecturer said when I asked him, what, is, what about Tantric Buddhism? He said, that's not Buddhism. So this other wise, nice fellow found Tantric Buddhism offensive. And why? Well, these Hindu images point to some of the reasons why. We can see here uh, Parvati and Shiva, uh, male and female, the Shiva and the Shakti of the universe, uh, make up the universe in the Hindu conception. And a number of Tantric deities will be modeled on Kali, uh, the blue-black one, who can even kill Shiva. And we see her standing here on his body about to kill him. So quite literally, Tantra refers to a loom. A loom has a warp and a woof. And this points to reality itself. Also, Tan is uh, derived from Tman, uh, or elongated or stretched. Uh, pointing to this very human body in which this defiled body we can attain awakening according to the Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhists. So this concept of Shakti or feminine power uh, will be critical to understanding how Tantric Buddhism works. Well, in many of the traditions, of course, exemplary monks found new sects or scholars and the like. But with the Tantric tradition, we see a very odd beginning for it. Uh, it's said that Nagarjuna, who we looked at uh, as a second Buddha, founder of the Mahayana, uh, even he's been called, and certainly uh, the ex explainer of emptiness or shunyata in history, that he is claimed by the Tantric tradition to have been the founder of Tantric Buddhism. But this is according to religious belief that he lived 600 years and is the same author of the Mula Madhyamaka Karakas as the Tantric author of several centuries later was. But certainly, as much as he exists in history, it is Tilopa, a brothel-owning sesame seed pounder, two low-caste jobs, uneducated, and yet, though, capable of amazing miracles, miraculous feats. And we may remember the Buddha rejected miracles as any kind of proof of anything. At some point in the course of Naropa's studies with Tilopa, Tilopa told him he must jump off a cliff uh, if he wants to give it his all for attaining Buddhahood. And we're told, believe it or not, uh, that Tilopa magically restored Naropa back to health after all his bones had been broken in the fall. So to unpack a lot of what goes on with Tantric Buddhism and its emphasis on this very body. We have to realize that Tantric Buddhism doesn't view the body like we might ordinarily. Rather than seeing sinew, flesh, mucus, poop, and bile like the Buddha stressed we should look at the body, Tantric Buddhism prefers to see the prana, the cosmic breath of the universe in our bodies, uh, with a central channel, the sushumna, uh, that 
around which our male and female energies or nadis uh, that twine around the central channel, also called the middle way, that central channel. And they course through energy centers of the body that are also associated with distinct physical organs like the third eye, for example. You can see these chakras depicted in this image. At the top is the Sahasrara, or thousand petaled lotus, which attains awakening and is also the exit of the consciousness from the body at, upon death. And then each of the other chakras has a gland associated with it as well. We can distinguish left-handed from right-handed Tantra. Left-handed Tantra uh, employs sometimes sexual practices to attain awakening uh, and breaking rules in order to attain the higher goal. Right-handed Tantra is straightforward and monks like the Dalai Lama, who is a Vajrayana or Tantric practitioner, uh, will not engage in any of these left handed practices and instead keeps straight and narrow uh, practicing the monk's standard vinya uh, and avoiding all contact with women uh, as according to traditional Buddhism. So the male and female play a big role in tantric Buddhism that they did not in the first two cycles of doctrine, the Theravada, if you will, and the Mahayana. Uh, the Vajrayana will talk about uh, the sun and moon mandala in Tantric Buddhism in Japan, the sun representing male wisdom and the moon mandala representing female compassion, and the two together are the Maha Mandala, or the great mandala, the union that points to tantric awakening in a practitioner, when in particular the nadis or male and female channels dissolve into the central channel, which my advisor Geshe Lundup Sopa said, feels like melting butter from the top of your crown all the way through the chakras. Personally, I wouldn't know. In Nepal, Buddhists will paint their houses with the colors of the five meditated or dhyani Buddhas. Here you can see all the many things associated with each one. Each Buddha, cosmic Buddha, has a quality uh, and practices, rituals, everything associated with it. Colors, tastes, and sounds even. But these Buddhas are nothing like the historical Buddha born in modern Nepal. These Buddhas exist as consciousness beings only. Although they can take shape in human form or animal form in multitudinous universes and worlds, believe it or not. So here you can see the bringer of Buddhism to Tibet, Padmasambhava, uh, originating after studies in Kanchi and South India, among other places, uh, and he will tame the demons of Tibet, even staking the demoness uh, from whom all Tibetans are thought to have emerged uh, to the ground of Tibet with spiritual stakes. And here you can see him practicing Tantric Buddhism in the sky with Yeche Tsogyal. Uh, and it's thought by the left-handed school that physical union of male and female are required for enlightenment. So this idea causes consternation, even anger, among followers of the other two iterations of Buddhism, the Theravada and Mahayana. Tantric Buddhism also has a unique structure of practice and theory the other two do not have. For one is the elevation of the idea of mantra. Mantras such as the famous Tibetan one, Om Mani Padme Hum, praise to the jewel in the lotus that I am. So jewel points to a male feature, 
It is hard and crystal clear. The jewel is in the lotus, which represents passive femininity. Whether we like these stereotypes of the sexes or not, that's what it represents. So mantra literally means to move the mind, and these chants are doing just that. They're pointing the consciousness of the practitioner to certain ideas upon which to meditate. A mandala is a visual representation of realities towards which the practitioner seeks to, to move. And the mudra point to hand gestures the Buddha himself made, uh, the earth-touching hand gesture, the have-no-fear hand gesture. These are also ways of expressing Buddhist truth in the Tantric tradition. But then, these also correspond, these three practices, to the uh, cosmic notions of the three secrets or three mysteries, is a better word, the triguhya, of body, speech, and mind. So speech is pointed to, points to the microcosmic resonating aspect of the universe and is the building block of everything. And that is also connected with mantra. Mind is next and uh, the mandala frames your mental consciousness. So it's visual. And this points to the mesocosm of our world, the place where you live your day-to-day -day life. And then finally, mudra points to the macrocosm, the embodied physical universe. So from microcosm to mesocosm to macrocosm, the tantric practitioner seeks to combine them all into one reality in their mind. So we may remember some classifications from earlier units. The term shravaka refers to students of the Buddha who listen to his message like deer, and they're analogized to a deer cart in the sense that a few can travel in it. Buddhism has a spot for the pratyeka Buddha or private Buddha, someone who just practices on their own without connection to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, likened to a goat who goes on their own way. And the Mahayana, we may recall, calls itself the great vehicle, the Mahayana, uh, because it can bring the most beings to the far shore of Nirvana, as it did with Pure Land Buddhism among peasants in China. And so the Mahayana also, we remember, uh, is associated with the cosmic salvation figure, if you will, the Bodhisattva, who postpones their own awakening to help others awaken. These will play a big role in Vajrayana Buddhism, and the awakening of all sentient life is a Mahayana concern that the Tantric tradition maintains. But it goes further than merely promising an ox cart like a Mahayana and uh, claims to take one even further down the path. And this, unlike Mahayana, is not a path for the masses of peasants of China. Tantra is reserved for an elite few who can attain its high standards of practice and theory. Like all the Buddhist schools, one goes from a lower level to higher levels of awakening. This is standard Buddhist view. And the tantric traditions are no different, starting with the outer tantras, as they're called. The strange concept comes uh, with the idea of a deity generating a mind impression. is literally what the term idam or ishta devata, a wished for god. In other words, not a real deity not like Krishna, certainly not like Jehovah or Allah, but a product of your own consciousness, but also existing on some ethereal plane of consciousness. So the Kriya Tantra, Action Tantra, one begins by practicing mantras and simple mudras, 
as part of the threefold practice of Tantric Buddhism and generate familiarity with the deity. So as you begin the outer Tantric practices, you will look to uh, see yourself as a subject in front of a great king who is the deity whose qualities you want in your own consciousness. So now with Tantric tradition, we expand the idea of gradual stages to awakening. In the Tantric tradition, they will look at the beginning practitioner as that Shravakayana, that hearer, uh, the, the standard Buddhist who listens to scriptures. From there, an evolution up through the Mahayana, who has a higher level in the Tantric tradition's conception. And then the Vajrayana has an outer, a beginning level, and an inner set of Tantras where one is getting awfully close to becoming a Buddha oneself. So one can meditate on a wished-for deity, an Ishta Devata, uh, depending on what one wants to do. One Tibetan Lama told us that uh, instead of coffee in the morning, he vaj meditates on Vajrapani, or Diamond Foot, who represents energy. So they're not real deities in the usual sense. So now with the fifth level, the Charya Tantra, you're no longer the subject of the deity like a king. Now the deity is your friend, somebody you know pretty well through continued practice of mantra, mandala, and mudra. So number six of nine stages uh, is the Yoga Tantra, and we're getting to the nearly the highest level of the outer tantras. And here you would obtain the empowerment of all five dhyani or meditative Buddhas. And you can see the whole universe as great emptiness and great luminosity of consciousness as well, believe it or not. So the inner tantras are where the rubber hits the road, the final three of the nine stages. In the Anuttara Yoga, the unsurpassable Yoga Tantras, there are no longer external activities involved with your practice. These are all internal. And so these last three are hard to map out for an ordinary consciousness like mine. Uh, I don't have the mind of a great Vajrayana practitioner, but we're told that at the Maha Yoga level, one can see the entire universe as a great mandala of which you and everyone you know are a part. This is also called the generation stage, preparing the tantric practitioner for the final two stops on the way to nirvana. Once again, without having done the practices, it's hard to differentiate these ethereal mental states they're talking about, but this involves the path of skillful means, how to apply the awareness of the universe as a great mandala of luminous, empty consciousness. And this culminates uh, in the final stage of Ati Yoga, where one's consciousness has dissolved into the universe and become pure light of emptiness or zeroness, as we discussed. And one has uh, merged with the ultimate body of the Buddha, the Dharmakaya Buddha. As we can see uh, in this Tibetan mandala, this individual has dissolved into pure Buddhahood, attaining the, what is called the rainbow body. Great tantric practitioners have attained the rainbow body at their death, uh, where their body emanates rainbow light for many days, and what's left is a small package where there had been a full human being, believe it or not. So then how do we work our way through the stages of Tantric Buddhist awakening? Famously are the six yogas of Naropa, that student of Tilopa, uh, and uh, his compendium of practices he learned in the course of his Tantric studies. The first is called heat or tummo, the angry mother energy within the body. And this is a science fact. 
Tibetan monks can raise their body temperature several degrees above normal through employing this technique and even melt snow off their body. And this involves the winds rushing through the energy channels of the body. Uh, and these monks can generate this tremendous heat from within. So vital energies enter the central channel of our consciousness and uh, dissolve into clear light at this point after we've already seen the universe is visualized as a giant mandala of reality all forms within reality are seen as deities and all sounds within the mandala universe are heard as mantras and all thoughts even dumb ones become pure wisdom so after attaining the illusory body and realizing the illusory nature of all things in our universe, one may move on to practice dream yoga. And in this, one is allegedly able to travel within one's dreams, as a Tibetan Lama once said he had, to peer into the hell realms or heavenly realms, uh, to make astral voyages, if you will, but also to visualize the entire universe now as a malleable dream, like the Matrix. So moving on with the fourth, or light yoga, one has now become nearly one with the Dharmakaya, or ultimate reality, body of awakening, or Buddha, the Dharmakaya Buddha, and that culminates in the fifth, the Bardo Yoga. The Sanskrit term is Antarabhava, or inner being, if you will, interior being, Antarabhava. And so there are said to be six of these intermediate states, or stages, or interior beings, if you will. We go through all of these stages in the course of a single lifetime, uh, beginning with our birth and the first of these, the natural bardo, which if you're watching this video and as I'm making it, we're in that one now, what we could call ordinary reality. The second world or interior being uh, is the meditative bardo. And when we're meditating, we're in a quite different state than our normal day-to-day. -day. Now we're tapping into the quiescence of our inner being, uh, and so this is distinguished as another state of being in Tantric Buddhism. The third of these bardos is uh, the dream yoga again, but now this is just dreams in your ordinary life. If you think about a dream you may have had, um, then you remember you weren't really there, but it was real for you, am I right? And in the Tantric tradition, this is another actual state of mental being. And for the Buddhist tradition, mental being kind of is really just the real being. And so through dream yoga, as with uh, attaining the dream state, uh, one can eventually master one's dreams uh, to control them and fly through the streets of Paris in your dreams if you're really good. So in the West, generally, we're familiar with the idea of life versus death as some kind of opposite. But with the Bardo, death is just another of these many phases um, of regular existence. So upon death, one allegedly hears the body caving in uh, and slowly fear starts to overwhelm the practitioner if they're not prepared uh, and it feels like the building is caving in. At some point, uh, the consciousness leaves the body through the crown chakra, the top of the head, and at that point, uh, one is said to be able to step through the final of the six bardos, the reality bardo. 
And uh, one Tibetan Lama explained it to us like this. Uh, Upon death, the adept practitioner who's trained ideally in tantric Buddhist practices will recognize the window of reality like a screen that descends briefly when the practitioner can jump through the screen, so to speak, and escape the round of rebirth. It's in that sense that Tantric Buddhism styles itself the fastest path to Nirvana. Finally, among the six yogas of Naropa is the transference of consciousness. So with this uh, is the idea that one can send one's own consciousness into another being, even an inanimate object like a rock. As the story goes that Marpa the translator needed to get to India and so sent his consciousness up into the body of a bird flying south and flew all the way to India till he spotted a man about to die in the process of dying and then sent his consciousness from the bird into the body of that man, uh, believe it or not. We see the three holy kings or righteous kings of Tibet. Son Sang Gampo will establish a Tibetan empire fighting Chinese and Arabs simultaneously and will choose a, a Chinese wife and a Nepali wife to represent the, the combination of the two great cultures in his kingdom. Tisong Detsen succeeds him and is famous for hosting a debate to decide whether the Tibetans will follow the Chinese or the Indians uh, in their form of Buddhism. In the end, the gradualism of the Indian approach is declared the winner uh, through Kamala Shila, the Indian pro proponent, over Hasha Moho Yen from China, who advocated the sudden approach we talked about in our fifth unit. Relwa Chen was so pious that his many meters long hair was sat upon by monks to show he was under the power of the Sangha. The Sangha was supreme and he will be murdered by Long Dharma, uh, who remains a villain in Tibetan literature to this day. And Long Dharma himself involves a peculiarly tantric story where Lalong Palkidorji is a yogi meditating in the mountains. Here's about Lang Dharma as the anti-Buddhist king who wants to restore the traditional Bun religion of Tibet. And Lalong Palkidorji descends from his mountain uh, all dressed in black with a black horse and then does the charm dance in front of the king himself and then the Cham dance involves an air, bow and arrow. And so, Halong Palkidorji uses a real bow and arrow and aims it right at the king and kills him and then escapes, turning his black cloak inside out to a white one, washing all the soot off his horse and body until they didn't know who to follow. The black horseman with the black horse was gone. And this is the kind of practice that also we'll see in the tantric ninja practice of Japan. So ninja and then these kind of stories we see in Tibet characterize tantric Buddhism, but not standard Mahayana Buddhism. For we may remember uh, the Buddha forbid any kind of killing. There's no such thing, good thing as should we kill Hitler? Well. The Tantric Buddhists will say yes, and the historical Buddha will say no. We can never kill any human being for any reason. We're told in the time of King Trisong Detsen, uh, Padmasambhava, the most famous Buddhist of Tibetan tradition, will come and subdue the demon of Tibet then he will enlighten several women practitioners through 
tantric sexual practices that the other traditions again will find abhorrent. And he is balanced by the scholar Shantarachita who will begin establishing the monastic centers of Tibet and bringing great scholarship to this nation. Buddhism will be a civilizing force in Central Asia and we, as we saw it was in South and Southeast Asia, but was not in Mahayana China, where we saw the collision of Confucianism and Taoism with Buddhism in China. With the so-called New Period, uh, Atisha, a great scholar from India, will come and scrub up all the naughty tantric practices and establish the standard monk Vinaya, no usual Buddhist moral practice. My advisor, Geshe Sopa, referred to the early period, the Nyingma, as the period of dark tantra, and then the new period is the period of the emergence of new monastic sex, stressing uh, moral behavior of the usual standard sort we see, or rules for monks. That brings us to Milarepa, founder of the Kagyu lineage, the Nyingma, the old school exists today. Then the Kagyu is another of the great sects. Milarepa is, along with Padmasambhava, the second most revered and famous figure in Tibetan literature. Milarepa's uh, family had been murdered, so he sought revenge by the through the destruction of uh, all the people in his village, the poisoning and the like. He could, though through many travails, finally uh, fly through the skies, believe it or not, among many other miraculous events. We see with the emergence of the Mongolian Empire, the Mongols too will become civilized through Buddhism, but in this case, the Buddhism is already fabricated in Tibet from the Indian sources from which it came. The Mongols will have Tibetan advisors, and those Tibetan advisors will be very powerful in the Mongolian Empire. Kublai Khan will uh, receive as an advisor Sakya Pandita from uh, Tibet and his student Pakpa. And Tibetan Buddhism will now become almost Pan-Eurasian through the Mongols. Sakya Pandita, as his name suggests, is connected to the Sakya monastic movement, which is also unusual for Buddhism passed down uh, hereditarily. So a father-son relationship, the next Sakya Lama will come from a Sakya family. So this makes it unique among uh, the four major Buddhist monastic lineages in Tibet. And then again, the unique feature not only of Vajrayana Buddhism, but in particular Tibetan political structure. The idea of a tulku or magically emanated body will become the dominant political ideology of Tibet. The idea that a consciousness of one person can reincarnate voluntarily in the body of another person in the future to come back and rule again. In Tibet it's not just the Dalai Lamas uh, who rule the whole nation, but there's the Dalai Lama of Tibet the Panchen Lama, also of Tibet. The third is the Jetsun Dampa of Mongolia. But then every province has its own tulku, or magically incarnated governor. So they call Tibet a theocracy historically. Well, there's no theos, but it was a buddhocracy for sure. So the Dalai Lama, for example, is considered such a tulku. Uh, and is the 14th incarnation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who, believe it or not, simultaneously manifests in many realms, not just planet Earth and the Tibetan culture. Uh, and on his death, 
the Dalai Lama will, in theory, be able to consciously choose his next rebirth, as did the 13th Dalai Lama, who predicted a rebirth in Mongolia, and, surprise, that's where they found the 14th Dalai Lama. And they do this uh, with three monks, three wise men, if you will, uh, looking for the new babe who can recognize, uh, as a young child, can recognize the Dalai Lama's former objects among similar objects. And then they know they've got the right being. Of course, some problems with that is, we have on the one hand the fifth Dalai Lama, who is very powerful, kind of an Abraham Lincoln of Tibet, if you will, who consolidates Tibetan power and begins constructing the Potala Palace. And this begins uh, the Gelupa sect, the virtuous sect, uh, which practices none of the left-handed tantric elements we've discussed. And then we should mention Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Gelupa sect, who will give it organizational rigor and be considered really perhaps the most influential Tibetan thinker in their history, according to the dominant Galupa sect, for sure, but instead are quite strict. I like to compare them to the Jesuits of the Catholics, very scholarly, uh, morally strict, and also the primary monastic lineage of the Dalai Lamas. And now, in the Manchu dynasty of China, it is not the Sakya sect, as it was for the Mongols, but the Qing dynasty and the Manchu rulers of China who will employ Tibetan Dalai Lamas and other Lamas as advisors, even as military governors in some cases. So we saw the role of the feminine is vastly magnified in Tantric Buddhism. It's, it's half of reality, just like we saw with Shiva and Shakti in the Hindu tradition, or Taoism has a similar theme of male and female energy in balance, making up reality. For women in Tibetan Buddhism, they are second-class citizens. There were about 28,000 until China's invasion in 1949. And now, uh, with the advent of Western women in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, they are gaining strength but again, as second-class citizens. And finally, Tibetans will see the Chinese invasion as the beginning of what they call the Buddhist Holocaust, where approximately 30% or more than a million Tibetans were killed, murdered in many cases, uh, by the Red Army's traversal through uh, the Tibetan kingdom. And that brings us to the uncanny prophecy of Padmasambhava some 1,300 years ago, where he said, When the iron bird flies and horses run on wheels, the Tibetan people will be scattered like ants across the world, and the Dharma will come to the land of the red man. So, iron bird flies pretty much looks like airplanes. Horses running on wheels kind of looks like cars. The land of the red man, well, that's a sadly a, a one term for the Native American people. And certainly the Tibetans were scattered across the globe, but then so were all their teachers. So now Tibetan teachers have established centers throughout the Western world, and there are even Western lamas or, or tukus, magically reincarnated beings of past Tibetans who opted to be reborn in the United States or Europe and the like. So there are so many more things to share about Tantric Buddhism, but in these short overviews. So this is kind of a snapshot of the origin, nature, and basic structure of Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism. And that leaves only, finally, the travels of Buddhism to the West now. So that is our final stop on this journey of global Buddhism will be Buddhism in the West.